I recently had my Texaversary. <laughs> That's what Joanna and I call uh, the day we first came to Texas. It was around the 4th of July, 2011, which means I'm starting my 14th year here at Walden Church. And 13 years ago, I did not have a vision for the church. I had never been a senior pastor before, never led so many people before. My hope at that time was, I'm just gonna listen to what God wants and then just go where he calls. And in these 13 years, we've had three different leaders of the board. We've had several youth and children's pastors and a few office workers come and go. Together, we have seen successes. We've seen failures. There have been misunderstandings. There have been tears. There have been times when the sanctuary was packed with people and there were people standing in the back of the room and there was other Sundays where there was only 10 people in the sanctuary. We have seen people accept Christ. We have seen couples meet, fall in love and get married. We have had plenty of good friends move away or pass. And we have seen some folks leave, some to serve in ministry or even larger churches and others have left with their feelings hurt. We have had our share of difficulty. We have wonderful times of blessing, but no matter highs or lows, the Bible promises in Romans that all things work together for good. So where do we go from here? How do we find direction? What does God want from us? And not just as Walden Community Church, but direction for any church. Because we, what we should not be is a building that has a wonderful collection of pews or a group of people that meet for social purposes or a relic of the past that has no significant relevance. That is not God's desire for his bride. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he writes, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is the Christ. For in one spirit, we are baptized into one body, Jews or great Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The church is called the body of Christ because Christ is the head of the church and we are called to do the work of Christ. Each like members of the body. We all have different skills, different purposes, different spiritual gifts, and every believer is equally important. So with that in mind, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we find direction? 2024 is pretty exciting because we'll have a very important event take place later this year. The Olympics, right? What, what were you thinking? We've all seen the Olympics on television. We have cheering fans in the stadium. They're cheering for the athletes. They're all dressed representing the colors of their countries. They all line up to compete. Now, what would happen if during a race, the firing guns went off and all the runners bolted off in different directions? How would we know who won? How would the athletes be able to tell who was better? What if they said, well, I trained really hard, I just didn't know which way to go? How meaningful would that race be? Christians should not be like that. So this morning I would like to talk about how we find our direction. And the Bible should guide us through this. We should consider the wisdom and the vision of these words because his word guides us. This is God's will. One such person who was wise, who knew God's will was Solomon. Solomon was King David's son, perhaps the wisest person who ever lived. Most of what he wrote in the book of Proverbs was after having lived a life pursuing worldly pleasures. And after a long time of that life, here's what Solomon had to say in Ecclesiastes at the very beginning of his book. He says, nothing but vapor, totally vapor. Everything is just vapor as it vanishes. That's how he starts his book. It's all meaningless. It's all vanity. Life is like smoke. It can be seen for a little bit and then pff, dissipates. And if you go all the way to the end of the book to read his final statement, he sums up everything and he says, the conclusion when everything has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. So he concludes, if life is short, to prevent life from being directionless, obey God 
and keep his commandments. Okay, that's grace. I mean, but I, I think we need something else. I, th I think we need just a little bit more because it's not just about obedience, right? Here's what Solomon writes in Proverbs 29. He says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Most of life is filled with uncertainty. This is especially true of the future. But if you can hold on to a vision of something that's coming, you can boost your chance of achieving that dream and being successful. When you apply that vision to the future, you have a vision, it can become extremely important. Given all the trials and tribulations that might come your way, when you have a clear vision of what you want to happen, you can make better decisions. Because as Solomon warns, without vision, people perish. In the Hebrew, perish is a word picture of shoelaces becoming untied or marbles spilling out all over to the table. It means chaos. It means disorder. You need to find direction or the people wander. The church needs to find direction or it risks becoming ineffective. Now, a lot of churches pull their structure and their organization from Paul. And there's good reason for that. Paul planted churches, he preached, he mentored students. But in looking for direction, I don't think we go back far enough. Before Paul, before the letters, even before Romans, before Hebrews, we have the book of Acts. And this is the record of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all who, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know, at first glance, there doesn't seem to be a lot there. It's just a handful of verses. But if you look close... I think you can find direction. What do we see? We see enthusiastic worship. This is what we do on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is number one, job one. How do I know? Because this is the one time when the majority of the people come to participate. Sunday morning worship is when you grow your faith and you help it feel fresh and strong. So our church staff works very hard to put together the components of worship that'll help it be fresh, help it be meaningful. But while we are planning, we need your enthusiasm and we need your attendance. We want you to be just as excited to be here. We want you to be excited to get out of bed every morning. This Sunday morning should be the type of morning that you don't wanna miss. Even our friends and neighbors, they should be showing up because they had to see it for themselves because of all the things that you were telling them about. And when Sunday morning is through and we're all heading out to our cars, there should be no doubt that that morning was a morning that gave God glory. The direction we see for our church should be enthusiastic worship and meaningful fellowship. Now, I think we do fellowship pretty well around here, but we need to be careful not to let it turn inward. Turning inward is when all of our attention is focused on members, especially the members that we like. If you're comfortable with your Sunday school class or your study group, there is a tendency to become content to the point that you never see the other people around us. But we need to be the type of church that always welcomes new people. And it's impossible to grow when you look at outsiders as outsiders. True fellowship isn't always about doing what we enjoy the most. Sometimes it means making sure that other people's needs are met before our own. And each of those important aspects leads to the next. If you have enthusiastic worship, people will come and attend. And when they attend, then we can offer them meaningful fellowship. And as trust begins to develop and friendships are formed, then we can offer dedicated discipleship. In the Acts passage, we see the first church devoted themselves to learning doctrine. That means they placed a high priority on becoming disciples who are equipped to take on the culture of the day. We must also take that seriously. Our culture is changing so rapidly. So the believer needs more than just a sermon on Sunday. They need to be taught how to apply these principles to their lives. 
A disciple is someone who is disciplined and someone who is growing. But in order for that to happen, we need to be mentors who take others under our wing and we help them learn how to grow in Jesus. Now, we have grief share counselors, we have Stephen ministers, we have a handful of Sunday school teachers on Sunday morning, but it doesn't have to end there. Take a moment and think. Have you ever had an idea for the church? What would you like to see? I, not necessarily to meet your needs, but the needs of others. What else could your church be doing? Another way of asking that is, how are the members serving? To make sure that worship, fellowship, and discipleship take place, we need members who are serving. Serving, or ministry, is helping us keep it from becoming inward and turning it outward. You know, before the Last Supper, Jesus took a towel and a water basin and he washed 12 sets of feet. Having a servant heart was modeled by Jesus so that each of his followers understood this teaching. Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. You know, in the Acts account, we find that it was the church that was sharing everything they had with those who had less. And the scriptures say that it was that action that brought signs and wonders from God. So it's always been the church's mission to give. And that service moves the heart of God. When we step out in faith and we do things, even things that we think that we can't do, then God gives us the strength, the resources, and the miracles begin to take place so that everyone realizes, oh, that thing you saw, that thing you watched, that thing you experienced, that wasn't from people, was it? Did you feel that? Yeah. That was the Lord in us, moving. You know, when the communists took over Russia in 1917, they did not make Christianity illegal. The Constitution, in fact, guaranteed freedom of religion. But what they did make illegal was for the church to intervene. The church could not perform acts of charity. The church wasn't allowed to feed the hungry. It wasn't allowed to teach the children. It wasn't allowed to house an orphan or care for the sick. And do you know what happened? 70 years after that, the church had grown irrelevant and out of touch. You take away service, and you take away the church's power. Without service, the church has no influence. The church is not effective. In Luke 21, the Bible says Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. This is not a parable. Did you ever stop and think about that? The story of the widow's might is not a parable. This was an observation Jesus made about the church and about worship. This is not a made-up story. This is real life. Forget the fact that there's money in this story. All right? Forget the fact that this is about money. I know the widow doesn't have a voice in this story. She doesn't have any speaking lines. But here's what she's saying. She says, I don't have a lot, but I will share what I have. And if we can all begin to think that way, if we can all begin to serve that way, lives will be touched, hearts will be changed, and that is evangelism. The church needs powerful evangelism. Acts 13 says, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. At the end of that Acts 2 passage, it says that that church in the first century grew. The Lord added to their number daily. Even during a time of persecution, the church grew. How do you get a church from Sunday service to people accepting the Lord? Those five points. You don't need a single page from Paul to accomplish any of those things. Paul has a lot of great commentary. I learned a lot from Paul. But that first church 
had the foundation already. Fellowship, worship, discipleship, service, evangelism. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. He commissioned us to share the gospel and to win souls. And the bottom line is, if we are not doing that, we are losing our direction. Second Peter says the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why did the book of Acts church succeed? Because the Bible says the early church was in agreement. They had singleness of mind. Lives were being saved daily because everybody was on board and everybody was serving. We have five imperative parts of the vision of our church. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism. And of those, I think we get a passing grade on worship and fellowship and ministering to those who are in need. But we have some serious holes in other places. And I am hoping that you can help me. And nobody is exempt. Nobody is exempt from worship. Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Is that you? Of course it is. How do I know that? Because you're breathing, <laughs> right? You're breathing. If you're breathing, then sing. But I don't like this song. Hey, I'm not asking you to like this song. I'm asking you to worship God. I don't know the words to this song. I always put the words on the screen. I'm not a good singer. Neither are the rest of us. There are no exemptions from worship. When people are looking around or they're even standing next to you, they should see us all enthusiastic in worship. Enthusiasm is contagious and the opposite is true. Lethargy is contagious. How many of you make an effort to get here 10 minutes early to shake hands and meet some people? How many of you are willing to sit closer so that people who come in late can sit in the back rows without embarrassment? What about fellowship? Are any of us exempt from that? Of course not. First Thessalonians says, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Galatians says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How many of you leave your row to shake hands? and to introduce yourself to strangers? How many of us stay for coffee and donuts and participate in potlucks and dinners and men's breakfast? Those are all ways that we can put people face to face with others. How many of you are obeying these verses? How are you encouraging others or allowing us to encourage you? Is anyone exempt from discipleship? It's funny how we wanna make sure that we pass all these laws to make sure that children get a certain level of education, but once we're out of school, pff, education is over. Many of us feel very strongly that we should be teaching children and teaching the youth. Well, what about adults? Are you done learning? Are you done growing? Are you retired from teaching? Proverbs 27 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. You know what I see in this passage? Two pieces of iron. <laughs> We need students and teachers. One cannot exist without the other. You know what happens when we have no teachers? Then we have no students. No students equals no growth. No growth, church dies. I don't like that math. That's backwards math. Are any of us exempt from evangelism? Are you serious? <laughs> the Great Commission wasn't given to just the super disciples. It was given so that every believer could take part in the kingdom. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Is that exhausting? Yes. Are we going to get burned out? Are you going to feel like quitting? Yes. But consider Noah. <laughs> Noah spent 70 years building an ark. And all during that time, he shared his vision of protection from a coming flood. And all of his preaching did not win a single soul. Only his family believed him. But that didn't stop him from preaching. 
Nehemiah gathered the people of Jerusalem to rebuild the walls that the enemy had broken down. And when he shared his vision, he got a lot of pushback from all the lazy, unenthusiastic people. But Nehemiah kept on working. He had a vision. And pretty soon, those massive walls were rebuilt around the city in just 52 days. His vision became reality. What is our vision? What is the vision at your church? How do we worship and fellowship and discipleship and evangelize more effectively? More Bible studies? More music? More drum solos? Different classes that are offered? Different types of people reached out to? Can you think of anything? What, what could your community really use? What, what, do, what does your community need? What do you think would help more people? Or what do you think would reach more people? A longer sermon, a shorter sermon? Is there a demographic your church is missing? What would make more of your non-church friends attend? What would make people who are seeking answers attend? Think about that. Make that suggestion to your church. Take that to God in prayer and then take that to the leaders of your church and say, this is what I think would help us. Andrew Carnegie was a philanthropist. In his lifetime, he gave away about $350 million to various educational institutions. He once said, the average person puts only 25% of their energy and ability into their work. But the world takes off its hat to those who put in more than 50% of their capacity. And it stands on its head for those few and far between souls who devote 100%. I would say that most people do not give anywhere near 100% to their work. But this is our responsibility when it comes to serving the Lord. But that is only for people who want to see their church grow. When we act like the body, when we all roll up our sleeves and help. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Jesus reminds us, the kingdom comes first. First. Jesus is saying, if you take care of my kingdom, I will take care of you. It's really easy to get content. It's really easy to get comfortable, to like things just the way they are, to not want anything to change. But when it comes to the Lord's commission, when it comes to his church, we should never be content. We should always be wanting to see more growth, more people, especially more people saved. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us what we need the most. Often we think that we need knowledge. We ask for wealth. We pray for happiness. But what we really need the most is wisdom. Thank you for loving us so much that you give wisdom generously. We thank you that even though we have our own idea of how our world and our life should look, often setting out and we do life according to our own plan, we try to make our own purpose, but Lord, it's your purpose that we should be pursuing. We ask that you prompt us when we set out to make our own plans and that you help us seek your will, not our own. Remind us to come alongside you as we surrender every detail to find your great purpose. Align our hearts with yours. Align our ideas with yours, our will with yours. Your ways are higher than ours. Your plans are greater than ours, and nothing is impossible for you. Lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Walden Community Church is a non-denominational church, which means we are a church for everyone. Whether you're a Catholic or Protestant, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, we welcome all. We are also a community church, which means we are here for everyone. So even if you're someone who just has questions or doubts or you're 
uh, you have bad history with church in your past, you're safe here. You're protected here. You're welcomed here and you're loved here. We have two services each week. Our 930 service is traditional. It has a choir. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel like the church that you grew up in. Our 11 o'clock service is a little more contemporary. We have a worship band. Please come comfortable. Come however you feel the, the best and bring your kids, bring your family. We have a uh, full Sunday school program from birth all the way through high school. And we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.